This is Ed Driscoll, and we're talking with Mark Stein of SteinOnline.com, who writes on stage, screen, and demographic and economic apocalypses, and is the regular guest host for a talk radio star you may have heard of called Rush Limbaugh. He's also the author of the New York Times bestselling book, After America, Get Ready For Armageddon, which is now out in paperback from Regnery Press. Mark, last year when After America debuted, we had Moody's lower America's debt rating and the British riots. This year, Regnery seems to be paying off rioters in Egypt and Libya and Yemen to promote the new book and America Alone, your look at America during the War on Terror, back when we still could call it a War on Terror. Mark, how do you manage to consistently gin up such great publicity for your books? <laughs> yeah, I know. I, the, the, my, my book ends with a fairly sort of apocalyptic nuclear finale, and uh, you might want to be out of town once Regnery <laughs> decide to do the publicity tie-in for that. But it's, it's true. When it came out uh, last year, uh, I, uh, I had the great good fortune on the day of the launch to uh, actually have the, uh, the Moody's downgrade. Uh, and I uh, and and basically uh, in the British riots, they were reenacting pretty explicitly my chapter on uh, Britannia's post-imperial decay. Uh, this this time round, you're right. The uh, what's going on in Libya and uh, Yemen and uh, various other uh, U.S. embassy compounds around the region. I think is that the next phase of that decline always starts with the money, but but. Uh, it, it then moves on to uh, to other things. When when money drains, power drains. I didn't agree with Condi Rice's uh, a lot of Condi Rice's speech at the Republican convention, but she had one one very good line in that when she said that uh, a nation that loses control of its finances eventually loses control of its destiny, and that's actually what you're seeing uh, on the streets of the uh, the Middle East. And while that's going on, Mark, what do you make of the Pentagon having Pastor Terry Jones on speed dial and ringing him up after this year's 9-11 riots? Yeah, I would, uh, I would fire uh, General Dempsey, the, the chief of staff for that. I say that, by the way, as, as a, <laughs> an immigrant to this country. One thing you notice about um, this country is that U.S. government is actually quite coercive. The, the United States Department of Justice if uh, if it decides to, can bring unlimited resources to bear on you. So can the United States uh, Treasury. The IRS has far more powers to uh, freeze your kid's bank account uh, than equivalent revenue agencies in most uh, free societies. So it's not a small thing when uh, the, the most senior military officer in uh, the United States government calls you at home over a film you've made. And it's simply not a, it's simply not appropriate. Uh, Kathy Shadle, my compatriot, the great Canadian blogger, had a had a had a, a, a joke about the uh, after the Manson killings, the uh, the Pentagon calling up uh, the the Beatles to warn them not to release the White Album or whichever it was uh, that had allegedly provoked uh, Charles Manson. But this is this is simply something. Uh, that the United States government should not be doing. Uh, it's it's legitimating essentially the view of these loons uh, that uh, the content of films and novels and cartoons and everything else is the business of the state. And that may be true in Islamic states, but it's not true in free societies. And again, there's a sort of futuristic chapter towards the end of my book uh, where it's sort of looking back on our time from around uh, whatever it is, 2020, 2025. And, and uh, when we look back from that time, we will marvel at how quickly uh, Western elites were willing to trade core Western principles such as freedom of speech. We see it in those that disgusting Twitter chain from the U.S. Embassy in Cairo. Uh, we see it in the weaselly words of uh, Secretary Clinton and President Obama. And we see it in that outrageous phone call uh, that General Dempsey made to Pastor, whatever his name is. Mark, we'll get back to your take on current events in just a moment. But perhaps we're getting a bit ahead of ourselves. For those who didn't read After America when it originally debuted last year, could you give us a quick outline of its thesis? The title alone must sound like crazy talk to someone trapped in the New York Times information cocoon. 
Yes, I, I mean, I think a lot of people have seen those sort of congressional budget office graphs uh, that that sort of uh, show the straight line going all the way up and, and sort of circa mid-century disappearing off the top of the page and uh, going up through the ceiling and out through the roof timbers. And I think that's the way people, even people who are aware of the multi-trillion dollar debt and the entitlements and all the rest of it, think of it as a problem for mid-century. That if we don't get that, yes, in theory, if we don't get this stuff under control, uh, then it will be consuming, you know, 800% of GDP by the year 2080 or whatever. And uh, in a sense, people think, well, that's going to be a problem for my grandkids, but, uh, but uh, nothing I need to deal with right now. The thesis of After America is that we're way beyond decline. We're worse than Greece. We're worse than Iceland. We're worse than Portugal. And if we don't get this stuff fixed by uh, mid-decade, not mid-century, then it's over. Uh, and by over, I mean that the United States, as we've known it, uh, will simply uh, cease to exist. It doesn't necessarily mean Mad Max on I-95, although I wouldn't rule that, rule that out. Uh, but it does mean uh, that everything gets worse, and it gets worse on a scale unknown to relatively small European countries in a bad way. In the end, anyone who's been in sort of rural Greek villages uh, knows that they could uh, take quite a bit of uh, you know decline and societal collapse uh, and when the dust clears, they'd be pretty much as they were. Iceland, for example, which was the sort of first country to go belly up uh, when the downturn hit in 2008. Uh, Iceland's dreams of sort of, uh, you know, being a major global uh, finance power are over. But Iceland is still pretty OK if you're Icelandic. And if you're not, who cares? It's not going to be like that with the United States. When the, when the U.S. goes over the cliff, it lands with a much bigger thud than Iceland, and it's in real danger of slipping past the point of no return circa 2015, 2016. Mark, as we're recording this interview, the Fed is announcing that QE3 is sailing, another round of what it calls quantitative easing, which is the newspeak euphemism for firing up the printing presses and printing more money. How's that going to work out? Yes, you know, what, what are the, one of the things that's, that's interesting to me about After America is I, I think there's a, an element of delusion on the right, too. Um, for example, I was, um, I, when I was doing the, making the rounds when the hardback edition came out, and it was around the time of the downgrade and everything, and I said, well, you know, say what you like about Greece, but Greece can't do quantitative easing. Uh, because it doesn't print its own currency. Greece is on the euro. One can have an argument about whether should, Greece should have got into the euro in the first place. But the fact is that Greece is in the euro now. So those guys have to figure something out without being able to do quantitative easing. And uh, a reporter on the Fox Business Channel uh, said to me, well, that just shows how, much, uh, how superior we are, how great we are. Because <laughs> I don't think so. I think, I think uh, quantitative easing is basically uh, your, your left hand uh, writing an IOU to your right hand. Uh, the, the, idea that, um, the idea that, which has been happening more or less since after America came out, that basically 70% of debt issued by the U.S. Treasury is bought by uh, the uh, Federal Reserve. Now, if you, that, that's basically like paying off your, uh, your MasterCard with your Visa card at the end of the month. You can do that for a while, but eventually that's, gonna, that's unreal. That's unreal. And quantitative easing is unreal. And I think in that sense, again, that's, that's a reason why whatever the, the insanity of Europe, I mean, the euro is a make-believe currency for a make-believe jurisdiction. Uh, but one thing it does do is it, is it eliminates... Uh, government's ability to quantitatively ease their way out of their irresponsibility. And in that sense, whatever you say about the Greeks, the Greeks aren't, aren't uh, lending money to their right hand with their left hand. Quantitative easing involves lending money on a gigantic basis. But there's also the money banks lend to individuals and families. Glenn Reynolds, my colleague at PJMedia.com, has linked to articles on the, quote, coming middle class anarchy. Our entire nation's economy rests upon the idea of owning a home and paying your mortgage each month. If enough people who are underwater say the system is rigged and nuts to all this, America's already fragile economy could be in deep, deep trouble. 
Yes, I, I think that's uh, I think that's certainly the case. I mean, I think if you look at what has been wrecked by government, uh, they include all the things that that prudent people. We're not talking about people with you know great ambitions. We're not even talking about you know dreams. We're not we're not talking about fancies. We're talking about just what prudent, responsible people do. Uh, people say, oh, you know, buy property. Uh, what is it? The Mark Twain line. They're not making any. Uh, uh, they're not making any more of it. You know, whatever. Uh, uh, buy, buy a home. Buy a house. Own your own. Own your own home. Uh, the government, through Fannie and Freddie and subprime mortgages, uh, wrecked the property market. So the idea, the whole sort of safe as houses concept, is gone. Um, then they said, oh, you know, get an education, get an education, get a qualification. You'll always have something to fall back on. Most American uh, qualifications are worthless and, and, and people stack up six figures of debt to acquire them. So they've wrecked that, uh, that uh, element too. So, that, so th- these are things that, as I said, not dreamers, but prudent, sensible people did. Get an education, buy buy property, look after your health. That's another thing that's wrecked now. So in other words, all the props of prudent, sensible, middle-class life have been hacked away at uh, by, by uh, government, big government interference with them. And there's not a lot left to wreck once you do that. And as you write in After America, starting a business is also increasingly anathema in Obama's America whether it's a kid with a lemonade stand or a hardware store who simply wants to put out its own coffee and donuts without being regulated to death. Yeah, I I think this is not small stuff. Um, And I think think there's a problem here. Uh, Again, there's a sort of element of delusion on the right about how important this stuff is, because people do get annoyed about it. Um, But but again, uh, it, it... they don't. They. I think a lot of people don't quite fully understand uh, the implications of it. A society in which you need five hundred dollars worth of permits uh, to put a lemonade stand on your lawn is not a free society. You could have the Second Amendment. I mean, a, a lot of people. Uh, when I mentioned that, I think it was on Rush. I mentioned the lemonade, uh, uh, like half a dozen lemonade stand stores uh, from around the country. And um, a couple of guys emailed me and said, "Oh, this this isn't this isn't important stuff, uh, uh, Stein. You shouldn't be talking. You shouldn't be talking about this. We've got the Second Amendment, so nobody's going to do all the. You know, nobody's going to uh, come and take away our freedoms. <laughs> That's all very well, but you could you can easily wind up in a situation where you you still have the Second Amendment, and every other freedom has been lost." Uh, a society in which you cannot legally sell lemonade in your front yard is not a free society. Uh, a society, uh, you mentioned the hardware store, a society in which a hardware store in Ventura County, California, cannot put out complimentary coffee and donuts for its customers is not a free society. Uh, and, and at some point, people have to get real about this. I think this is the way, this is one of the reasons by the way, whether the sort of codification of the U.S. Constitution actually gets in the way of looking at things uh, clearly. Because, because clearly what's happened over the course of the last 80 years is, uh, is that successive governments at the national level, but also at the state and county level, have ridden a coach and horses through the principles of the U.S. Constitution. But because it's still there uh, on a piece of paper, uh, that some guy put down on parchment with uh, ink and quill feather, and it's actually written down. People still think uh, that, 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 that it's there and it's effective, even though 80 years of big government expansion has, has basically uh, driven a coach and horses through it. Mark, a number of America's current woes seem to come down to the excesses of academia. They created what Yale's David Galerter calls America Light, in which the culture of America has essentially been hollowed out. And they've created what the aforementioned Glenn Reynolds calls the higher education bubble. And now in Rahm Emanuel, Chicago, we're seeing the lower education bubble, as his teachers are currently on strike. Do these bubbles give conservatives an opportunity to reform that broken and increasingly fiscally broke system? 
I would, I would like to think so. Um, in, in a strange way, I think the uh, Rahm Emanuel situation is actually more serious because um, it, it's, it's more disturbing to me that you've got this kind of social engineering in kindergarten and grade one uh, than by the time people get to middle age, like Sandra Fluke, because basically by that point, uh, you've had, uh, well, how old is she? 31. So she's basically had 25, 26 years of this stuff. So, so in a way, I regard I, I regard the the smashing of the uh, teachers' union monopoly uh, as a, as absolutely critical uh, to this country. Um, I, I think I think the right abandoned almost all the levers of society that mattered apart from electoral success, and I think we saw in two thousand eight. By the way, Obama and uh, and and Mrs. Uh, Obama are themselves superb embodiments of the worthlessness of this over-credential society. If you look at Obama, he's had uh, basically a million bucks worth of elite education between uh, Occidental, uh, Columbia, and Harvard Law, uh, and then he goes and becomes a community organizer. If, 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 uh, if he hadn't become president, nobody would think that was any kind of uh, you know, return on investment for, for what that guy's education is supposedly worth. Mrs. Obama, likewise, goes to Princeton uh, and becomes basically the sort of the diversity outreach consultant for the University of Chicago hospitals, a job so essential uh, that, uh, that, that that they pay her three hundred and eighty thousand dollars a year. And when she uh, becomes when she has to leave it to become first lady, it's so indispensable that diversity outreach consultant job they don't even bother replacing her. I mean, these two uh, in their in their disconnect from uh, any kind of uh, primary wealth creation, uh, I think, embody the sort of decay uh, of of, uh, of America in, in that they, uh, if, you, if you recall, people mocked Sarah Palin because she, she'd been a mayor and before that she'd run a commercial fishing operation in Mozilla. And people thought that was, for some reason, that was a kind of snare. She'd been in trade. Uh, as opposed to thinking big thoughts like Obama. I mean, the elites in this country now are like kind of dowager duchesses in uh, in in, a, in in an English social comedy from the late uh, 19th century. That you know they're horrified by mere tradesmen. Oh my dear, Sarah Palin, commercial fishing operation. Why why could it, why couldn't she have been a a a, 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 a supposed community who done a little light community organising like Obama? Nobody would want to live in a community that had been organised by Obama. The community he did organise. Uh, they have what? What are they up to now? Uh, a dozen murders on uh, on a good weekend in uh, in Chicago. This this I think this the, the sort of decay of the elites and the decay into a kind of Latin American setup where you have this super privileged elite at the top and then a vast dysfunctional mass underneath and no middle class. I think that's I think that's where we're headed if we don't change course. So with all of that as prologue with the ongoing collapse of so many aspects of what makes up Barack Obama's worldview, why is Mitt Romney seemingly flailing in the polls as of the time of our interview? Yeah, that, that bothers me too, because this guy ought to be losing by 10 points at least. Um, and I know people say, well, it's a 50-50 nation and it's going to be a tight election and all the rest of it. If it's tight this time around, that says something very alarming. You know, a lot of people don't simply don't get the numbers. The word trillion doesn't really mean anything to people. It has no relation to their lives. And at a certain point, it takes on a bit of unreality because if you can if you can spend trillions of dollars you don't have, and you do it for one year, and you do it for two years, and you do it for five years, uh, people think, well, why can't we keep on doing that? So that doesn't seem like a real problem to many people. Um, and then I think I think there's something even more worrying that if you go back to 2008, and we all did this at the time, we said, basically, those of us, you know, who, however reluctantly supported McCain, uh, when he lost, we said, well, the guy gave the impression he wanted to lose, and people were t exhausted by war, and people were tired of the Bush administration, and uh, the Republicans hadn't covered themselves in glory in the previous couple of years, and this guy would be the first black president, and everyone's saying he's the, the greatest speaker of all time, and he's a real glamorous celebrity figure. You know, McCain did the thing where he was uh, mocking uh, Obama as the celebrity ad. Now we've had four years of him. He's a crashing bore. 
He's not a great speaker. He's got nothing new to say. He staggers around uh, doing the same, uh, giving the same leaden speech uh, as the economy flatlines, as uh, the jobs market shrivels, as people in their early 50s go on disability and people in their late 20s move back uh, with their parents. If he gets elected as the non-glamorous failure, uh, what that would mean is that America is essentially uh, saying uh, there's no prospect of recovery. Uh, we're, we're sticking with uh, big nanny Obama uh, because at least uh, he's guaranteeing our food stamps and our disability checks. And, uh, and they would essentially be accepting a, uh, a, 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 they would be accepting, I think, a, a kind of uh, a, a, a European nanny state view of America uh, that, would, that would, in effect, spell the end of this country. It's, they'd be basically saying there's no possibility of an American dream. Uh, yes, we could vote for Obama, but who wants, uh, for Romney, but who wants to take a flyer on economic recovery? At least if we uh, go with Obama, we have the certainty of the food stamps and the certainty of the disability checks. That's a te- There's no hope. They're, they're, he's, basically, he's basically offering them the hope, the, the certainty of no change. And he's saying in it, when, when everything gets bad and it's going to be bad for as far as the eye can see, Vote for me because you'll get your food stamps. And that certainly sounds like after America to me, or at least the America that I grew up with. Yeah, I think I think it is. I think it is after America. And the difference, I think, I think the the, the point the point I try to make in the book, Ed, which is, you know, really I think very important, is that Europe's post-war decline was cushioned by the United States. Um, the successor power, the, the, the power that inherited Britain's global networks built up over the previous century and a half, that's the smoothest transition of global order ever in world history, to the point where I don't think uh, historians in centuries to come will even look on it as a transfer. They'll look on the sort of Anglo-American imperium from the Battle of Trafalgar for the next two centuries as one continuous period. Um, but the but the, it's not going to go that 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 way this time round. That's really what we're seeing on the streets of uh, on the streets of Benghazi and Cairo, is that there is no we will be living in a world with no order. And again, the isolationist right, the Ron Paul guys say, well, you know, who needs the rest of the world? Screw off. Uh, we can be a 19th century isolationist republic uh, and don't have to get mixed up with any of this stuff. Uh, I mean, get real. Show me what's show me in your house something that's made in America. Where's your 19th century yeoman republic gone? Go take me to your local Walmart and show me something that's made in the United States of America. When everything in your home, you, you know, it's easy to say we don't want to be the big global policeman. We just want to be rich and fat and happy and watch Dancing with the Stars. But when the TV you're watching Dancing with the Stars on is made on the other side of the planet, uh, when the clothes you're wearing are made on the other side of the planet, when everything comes from the other side of the planet, you're engaged with the world whether you want to be or not. So don't give me this 19th century isolationist mumbo jumbo though that that ship has sailed it's a container ship and it sailed to shanghai to pick up all the junk in walmart uh, that you guys uh, want to buy because it's cheaper than trying to make it over here well sadly perhaps like america itself we're now out of time this is ed driscoll for pjmedia.com and we've been talking with mark stein of steinonline.com the author of last year's new york times bestseller after america Get ready for Armageddon. It's now out in paperback, both at Amazon.com and your local bookseller. And Mark, thank you for stopping by once again. Hey, always a pleasure, Ed.